Guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Ben with Mechanized Cleaning Solutions, and a couple years ago, or maybe a year and a half, I promised you guys we'd do uh, an equipment tour. Uh, that would be the next video. But, you know, after we did that first video, uh, it's like everything else. The, basically, I don't think it really anybody saw it. Nobody cared. Um, I got really busy and uh, just didn't do anything with it. We're uh, talking about this how-to series for reclamation pressure washing. So if you're a pressure washing contractor and you wanna get into picking up wash water, we're gonna help you do that. Um, where are we at? Well, we left off the video with how I got started, our story, our company background, and then the next step was to go through and show you basically everything that we use to do this kind of work. And, uh, and then as we go in on the detail, start breaking things down in minutia so you can see how to do everything from start to finish and uh operate a little niche business that will kind of set you apart and allow you to do things that other uh, other pressure washing contractors either can't or don't want to do uh, it's a really great situation for us and uh it's evolved to the point where we're kind of just our own little thing and uh it's really great so <clears throat> today uh, oh yeah, what I wanted to say was that, okay, so we did this like a year and a half ago, uh, had this big conversation with you guys uh, about our history, what I do, who I am, how I got into this work. But um, there was just, like I said, there was like no interest and probably nobody, I don't know, maybe a handful of people saw the video, but you know, over the last, I don't know, like maybe three or four months, I started getting uh, notes on YouTube uh, in the comments, uh, a couple of emails and phone calls. And it's like, I guess like a year and a half later, or maybe two years later, this video has gotten a little bit of traffic and there are people reaching out and wanna, or asking me to pick this series back up. And uh, so we're gonna do that. So we're gonna start today and we're going to do, what we're gonna be doing is just looking at the major equipment pieces. Then we'll get down into more detail later with the smaller stuff, the supporting tooling. But uh, we're gonna be looking at the, the types of hot water machines that we use, the way that they're mounted, the way that we get them around, the way that we use them. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll go into the next video. We'll go into uh, subcomponent tooling, surface cleaners, the small stuff, the right kind of leaf blowers to use. Uh, but for today, we're just gonna look at all the big stuff. And then uh, I gotta get into some repairs and I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. But um, we're gonna start out first by looking at the hot water pressure washers. Uh, here's one right here. Uh, this is one that's on a trailer. Uh, there's a couple other ones that are gonna be more important to look at though. And then we're going to be looking at the vacuum systems. And then we're going to be looking at the wintertime stuff that we use, snow plows and salt spreaders, because look, you guys are pressure washers. You're going to have to find something to do in the wintertime. It's all fine and dandy when you're a single owner operator, you can kind of make the seasonal thing work. But you know, when you have employees and you're going to have to have employees because this work is, you can't be done by single dudes. <clears throat> you got to find something to do in the wintertime. And uh, snow plowing and de-icing in particularly is a really good, source of income and uh, you can make a lot of money and keep your ARs flowing nicely in the winter time and keep some cash flow and plus it's fun to break up the year with uh other stuff that you're doing so in a lot of ways it's kind of like a landscaping company you you do one kind of thing in the spring you do one kind of thing in the summer you do one kind of thing in the fall and you do one kind of thing in the winter time and it kind of breaks the year up and so you go through these seasonal cycles in the type of work that you're doing and the type of work that you're focusing on and the amount of money that you make. So let's get into this. Okay, so for reclamation pressure washing, uh, a big part of the work you're gonna be doing is not stuff that you might say would be like environmentally friendly pressure washing or it's not gonna be billed that way or sold that way, but it's gonna be as a matter of practicality, you know, we're still kind of in a phase where people you know, care about not flushing shit out to the storm drains, but what they really more care about is their, their bank accounts and they don't want to have, uh, you know, too big of an expenditure on, on expenditure on something they consider not to be a heavy line item, you know, seasonally pressure washing the sidewalks, but getting into this stuff, uh, you know, when you as a contractor are saying, okay, well, I just want to, really focus on stormwater friendly pressure washing and I only want to do jobs where the water's got to be picked up or at least I want that to be a big part of my business. 
Um, parking garages are going to be a huge part of the work that you do. Parking garages are awesome. Parking garages are big areas. They're flat, they're hard to clean, and you can make pretty good money doing them. So, but parking garages present another kind of challenge. They're enclosed structures. They often have bad ventilation and there are weight limits, height clearance limits. So this all determines what your equipment is going to be like. Weight is very important. You don't want these things crashing through the floors because they're just too heavy. I mean, you're talking about vacuum tanks and service body trucks. And uh, a lot of garages are not, not all, but some are not in a, in a, they can't take a lot of weight. So you gotta be really careful about when you're building this stuff, how heavy you make it and how tall you make it, which has a lot of impact on the way that they function. So ex as an example, let's go look at a normal hot water machine that you can go and buy from a company like, like uh, Mighty M Corporation or Hydrotech. You have a hot water pressure washing skid. Of course, hot water is important. And you have like a trailer. The, a lot of times I'll put these things on little single axle trailers with like torsion, like a single torsion axle. won't even have a leaf spring, which is really good because it stays on weight and they handle a little better. And then it'll have a bulk wa water tank on the back couple hundred gallons usually and then a couple of hose reels and so when people think of a commercial hot water pressure washing system that's what they're thinking of but mighty m does a really good job in my opinion they make the best hot water skids but the dimensions of these things are not right for cleaning parking garages unless you have like extra trucks you can bring so the ideal system is to have something light and deployable that's easy to move around that means you could have a hot water pressure washing system and a vacuum system on a trailer, which is the way we used to do it, but this makes the trailers really big. And when you're in parking garages and you're doing parking garages for a living, you're gonna be doing small garages too, as a necessity. And where there's parking garages is generally in cities. And so there's not a lot of room. So you can't have a big trailers. You need to have a compact system. That means putting the hot water system in the back of a truck and then having as small a trailer as possible so that you can get around corners and pillars and get into alleys and things like that without having too big of a piece of equipment. So if you wanna have the hot water machine in the back of a truck, like one that you can buy like this one, it's not gonna work for a parking garage because A, it's too tall. And the reason is, is because garages are low clearance structures and you see the burner for this thing, which is that silver tube on top, that's a steel coil that the water goes around and around and around and around and around in and it, while it's traveling through that rat maze of, of pipe it's being heated up by fire that's hitting those inside of that coil and but the exhaust for that is right on top so if you take this thing this skid and you take it off this trailer and you stick it in the back of a truck you have that burner which is sitting right below where the sprinkler heads in the garage are you'll set those sprinkler heads off and about 5,000 gallons of water or 10,000 gallons of water will come down on the floors in about two minutes. Not to mention the fire department's gonna come. It's gonna be very embarrassing. The customer's gonna hate you. It's gonna be a giant mess. So you don't wanna do that. So what we do is we take these prefabbed commercial hot water skids that have these like forklift pockets in them and I disassemble them and then mount them in the backs of the trucks. And so the way we had it for a while was I would just like take the engine and the burner, take all that shit apart, and then just sort of permanently mount it in the back of the truck. But that only works for so long because then you realize, oh, I can't do anything with my truck because this stuff's all permanently bolted in the bed. I can't stick anything back there. I can't do anything else with it. So we wind up custom fabbing up our own skids. We take all the components out of that factory skid and we make our own skid, which is just lower than the base of the cab. And the burner, of course, is a lot lower, so it's not gonna set up the sprinkler heads. We can also integrate the water tank and then make this whole hot water system fork liftable out of the back of the truck. But essentially, you have a burner coil, water tank. You have the uh, small engine here. It's about a 24 horse Honda engine. There's a pressure pump. And then also these systems uh, have built-in 110 volt generators, which are really good because the types of systems that fire these burners come in two flavors, 12 volt or 110 volt. The 12 volt systems, which are a little bit less expensive, use the charging system on the engine 
to fire the Beckett oil burner or the whatever kind of oil burner you're using. It's just a kerosene or diesel burner, which is mounted on the end of the coil. But by far, the 110 volt systems are superior. They heat the water up. They can put them on bigger coils that are longer, which give you a better efficiency when you're heating up the water and you wind up don't have under, uh, under heating of the water. And then of course, when you're building your own skids that are fork liftable so that the truck can be used for other things in short order, then you wind up having to do your own valving and plumbing. You got ball valves, pressure gauges, hot water switches, unloader valves, and uh, you make this whole system work smoothly and efficiently. And then also you want this to be easy to work on because these things take a lot of maintenance uh, if you want them to run for a long time. And all of my skids are going on Oh, I think 10 years old. And if you take care of these things, you know, at the most, you have to like change the oil and maybe spark plugs or a fuel filter or something like that. But basically the, you know, the pressure pumps, the main components, the pumps, the generators, the engines, they're all long lasting. I, my oldest one's like 15 years old. It's probably got, I don't know, maybe eight or 9,000 hours on it. It still runs great. Haven't even had to do a valve job on them yet. So really good systems these mighty m systems are awesome the problem is the packaging they come in that one over there on that trailer they have to be made to go like this so that they can go inside parking garages which means you got to learn how to weld <laughs> or you got to know somebody who knows how to weld uh this is one system here i like to put these things not in pickup trucks because you wind up having to take so much shit to these job sites to keep to keep the jobs working that you need all kinds of stuff you need extra fittings you need places to put tools you need places to put caution tape pump sprayers leaf blowers all that stuff so i like to mount our pressure washing systems in service body trucks that have the doors on the sides and then from there you got a couple of options you got dual rear wheel you know when you have like an f350 or like a dodge 3500 you can have dually rear wheels which give you wider compartment boxes or you can go with single rear wheels, which have a narrower service body door. So you don't get as much horizontal width. You can't put as much stuff in the box. Then the, uh, the ones that have dual rear wheels, the, the surface body is a little bit wider. The bed will still be about four feet wide, which is a good standard bed width, but you don't get as much space this way inside the doors and that that's actually important but i've opted to go with single rear wheels because it makes the truck lighter it makes it more maneuverable and uh it's just in my opinion it's a better option it's easier to work on when you got to do like a wheel seal the axle goes out or something like that just easier to work on and also get you out of the realm of the federal dot guys so when you're doing this kind of equipment you wind up uh having heavier trucks that are like sort of like 10,000 pound gross vehicle weight trucks but if you stay under 10,000 pounds you're less likely to be interacting with the dot guys in the freeway which can be sticklers about you know lights on your trucks and you know shit brakes and it sucks when you have a dot guy pull you over and put your trailer out of service because you had dual rear wheels instead of single rear wheels which put you in their sort of weight jurisdiction and then now they're eyeballing every little thing on your trailer to make sure that this works and a lot of times these guys pull you over just because they got nothing to do and that's their job is to just randomly pull people over and just give them basically a an improvised pre-trip inspection right there on the side of the freeway and if you got a light that's not working or your breakaway your battery breakaway box doesn't cause the brakes to lock up they'll just put you out of service right there on the freeway and you're grounded you're not getting to your job site and you got to call your customer and tell them you're not going to make it so there are reasons very important reasons why every single thing about these systems is the way that it is. So, and these trucks got to be four wheel drive because we use them to plow snow in the winter time. So, you know, it's like I say, the detail matters. The detail's very important, but let's go look at one of these hot water systems in a little bit more detail. We'll talk about the differences between the 12 volt systems and the 110 volt burner systems. And uh, we're going to look at uh, the sort of factory skid here without looking at the ones that I've modified. But essentially what you got here is you got a remote start ignition. And what they're doing is they're just bypassing the little uh, factory key. I don't know. Mighty M likes to do that for some reason. But uh, 
you have an engine it puts out about 24 horsepower 20 to 24 horsepower and it's pushing a belt driven pressure pump and uh you know anytime you're getting into pressure washing and trying to make money on it you're always going to want to go with a belt driven system uh it's more efficient for a lot of reasons but you can see that there's gear reduction there and the pumps work on a slightly different principle when they're belt driven versus the pumps that mount directly on the engines like the ones you're used to buying at like home depot and stuff like that they're they're more efficient they can do more work per stroke they run smoother they put out more pressure and they put out more volume and it just makes your work a hell of a lot easier and then if you look back in there you'll see a generator back there which is ultimately wired to 110 volt gfci power box so you've got the ability to plug in stuff um to draw 110 volt power like lights water pumps things like that but that generator powers the uh oil burner there so this is the 110 volt system which is quite a bit better than the 12 volt models and also the 12 volt burner systems rely on the charging system in the engine to supply the current to fire the burner and um if anybody's ever worked with small engines you know that those charging systems constantly go out in fact i have to replace the charging system on this engine which has gone out for a, it's actually been gone a couple of years but i haven't needed to replace it i've just been running it off a truck battery i used to have this this skid right here mounted in the back of a bucket truck and that was really handy but that truck became a pain in the ass so i got rid of it and i had the skid laying around so i decided to do something with it and i originally had this trailer which was a, originally a hydrotech trailer that came with the hydrotech skid it was like it was a five gallon per minute at 3000 psi hot water skid similar to this mighty m 3506 which means 3500 psi at six gallons per minute it's actually 5.7 but that's that's the model 3506 um after i took that original skid off of this trailer i had converted this trailer into a soft washing trailer and that big 300 gallon tank on the floor in there used to basically sit on this entire trailer and it had this little soft wash pump for bleaching buildings plumbed up and we just used that like a water supply trailer so there's like this one job we do where uh we go and wash down this fuel pad that doesn't have any water access on it this fuel pad is just a mile in that direction over there about a mile and a half and it's it's about a i'd say about about 300 yards away from the city's wellhead and this fuel pad doesn't have a canopy and the trucks are constantly spilling fuel on the pad and there's like a really crappy oil water separator plumbed into the pads uh drainage system and it's really it's, it's constantly pissing the city off so this fueling company has us go out there weekly and pressure wash this fuel pad because the city of Redmond is constantly getting upset with fuel runoffs being tracked out into the street and infiltrating the storm drains and basically just being a mess over there all the time. So, but there's no water over there. So I had this thing set up basically as a water supply trailer just so we could do this one job every freaking Friday. We go over there and we hose down this pad with soapy water and suck it all up. If you go to our website and you go to the emergency response or the fuel spill, cleanup page i think it's called emergency services page you'll see a video of us cleaning that fuel pad the way we do it with one of the hot water trucks and the vacuum trailer anyways so when i got rid of that f450 bucket truck that i used to have this pressure washer and that water tank in the back of just like a hot water truck that had a boom lift on the top of it i decided to put this skid back on the trailer but also retain the original systems soft washing capabilities so if you've ever seen one of these hot water trailers you're like what is this extra ball valve over here and all these hoses and what is all this extra plumbing over here you guys probably know about these some of you guys have these hot water skids um this is basically a, a six gallon per minute hot water system but they can also function simultaneously as a bleaching system so if you're ever soft washing buildings bleaching buildings you have a little pump here a little 12 volt on demand it's like seven gallons a minute 100 psi and it just basically will throw any kind of chemical onto a building and then you can use the hot water system to rinse it off so there is this two water tanks here there's a big bulk tanks about 200 190 gallons and then you have this little tiny um water tank here that the pressure washer can operate off of as an alternative 
So I can, what we can do is we can like say fill this tank with sodium hypochlorite and a surfactant and go soft wash or bleach somebody's house or somebody's office building, get all the green off of it without actually pressure washing it. And uh, that little diaphragm pump will operate off of this tank while the pressure washer operates off of this little tank, which is being fed by a hose reel. So what I can tell this trailer to do is this ball valve is what is comes from this water supply hose. So if I hook that up to a wall, I can tell this hose reel to either feed the big water tank right here, or if I put this valve in the down position, it'll re-divert that incoming water to that small tank. So this pressure washer can use the big tank or it can use that small tank. That's an option. And then over here, I can tell the pressure washer pump to either draw from the little tank, or if I put this valve in the up position, now the pressure washer pump is drawing from the big tank. Okay, and there's another ball valve right here that tells the machine, this is for the bypass. So like when you're pressure washing and you're spraying with your gun or your surface cleaner and you let off the trigger, what happens is the pressure pump keeps turning. Water's still moving. Where does it go? If it's not going out of your gun, it's gotta go somewhere or the whole system will explode because this thing puts out 3,500 pounds of pressure. That's this job, this guy's little job right here. This is the unloader valve. When you let off the gun, that water gets redirected somewhere. When it's in this position, the water will just be recycled back to the tank, which is good because the pressure washer is drawing water out of the big tank and then sending it back to the big tank when it's not going out of the gun. That's the bypass function. There's advantages to that and reasons why you want to do that, but sometimes there are reasons why you don't want to do that. So if I move this valve to another position here, the pressure washer's bypass function now goes in a circle. It's not being bypassed back to the tank. The system is not drawing new water when you're not spraying. Just whatever water is currently in the system going from the, like say the little tank or the big tank to the pump just starts going in a circle. And that what will what'll happen? That will allow the water tank to fill back up because like when you're stretching and wrapping up a hose or something like that, and your machine's running, the machine's still running and circulating water, but no water's leaving the system. So your supply starts to go back up. That's the way these float systems work. And also let's suppose you're like in a situation where you're like doing a trash compactor or something like that. And you wanna drop your chemical straw into a bucket of soap. And you don't want that soapy water being recycled back to your tank because you wanna keep only clean water in your tank. So for example, you wanna pressure wash with soap with a downstream injector. You would draw water from your little tank you would keep the bypass from going back to the big tank so that when you're ready to rinse with clean water, you simply switch a ball valve, turn off your soap knob right here. So you're not drawing any more soap out of your bucket and then you start rinsing with clean water. That's the way you keep these systems compartmentalized, so to speak. Now this over here, this little ball valve simply tells this little soft wash pump to either draw water from the big tank or if you put this valve up, it'll draw water from this little garden hose fitting. And I have this in here. So like if I have a 55 gallon drum of sodium hypochlorite and I want that sodium hypochlorite to go in this big tank to supply the soft wash pump on a job, I would just simply hook a hose up right here, drop a straw in a 50 gallon drum. And then the soft wash pump, instead of squirting water out of that fitting, will squirt it into this tank. So I can use the pump to not, only, to not only spray down a building, but I can also use it to load detergent into the tank here. So that's what all this extra stuff on this trailer is for that you wouldn't normally see on these Hydrotech or, or uh, Mighty M trailers. This is, just has, this is just a hot water trailer that has a little extra capability for, to have a little uh, detergent supply or soft wash solution, which is essentially bleach or sodium, sodium hypochlorite and a surfactant added into this system. But essentially what you got here is a couple fuel tanks. You got an engine, a pressure pump, a generator, and a burner. And then you have some peripheral stuff, a water tank and valves and hose reels and whatever. But this is how these systems typically come. But the problem is when you're cleaning parking garages, the skid is too wide. It's like 49 inches. The beds of the trucks are 48 inches. So Mighty M for all their foresight 
design these things to be stuck in the back of normal pickups that are a little bit wider than traditional service body trucks. But service body trucks are better, especially when you're doing work, and especially when you're doing work on construction sites where you just need to have tons of fittings and little parts and little tools and all kinds of shit. And it's just really good to organize that stuff into service body doors because you just don't have three hours every morning to do a specific loadout for every different job you're gonna be. It's just better to have a bunch of shit already in your truck and it's just always in there. Later, we'll do a video about how we organize the different tools and all the little things that we have to bring to make pressure washing work long term on a scale where you're going to go and do any kind of job anywhere so like i said all this stuff has a use and a specific person a specific purpose and it's exactly the way it is for a very specific reason so uh yeah that pretty much does it for the uh the hot water skids this is a six gallon per minute skid but for the garage cleaning systems you want to run eight gallons per minute and you don't want to be running at 3,500 PSI. You want to be running lower at 3,000 PSI. There are very important reasons for that. We'll get into that later. But essentially, when you're cleaning garages, it's about time and efficiency. So this system being basically identical to that system over there, and this system and that system over there, are, these are the same. These are basically garage cleaning trucks. This is what they use. We do them, we use them to clean fuel stations and stuff like that, but they're basically set up for parking garages because parking garages have the most limitations. So it's like the weakest link in your chain type situation. You want to, you want this truck to be able to go in anywhere and do anything. You have to set it up for the most restricted type of job you're going to go do. And uh, this is the way, this is why these things are the way that they are. So, <clears throat> This system here being 8 GPM or 8 gallons per minute at 3000 PSI. That allows you to run two, not one, four gallon per minute vacuum surface cleaners. Now, there are reasons why you wanna run four gallons per minute instead of eight gallons per minute when you're doing reclamation work. Uh, when you're picking up wash water, or let's say, let's, let's, talk, let's look at this in terms of when you're cleaning a parking garage. When you're cleaning a parking garage and you're bringing water capture tactics to bear and you have to give a bid to a customer who's gonna be getting bids from other people who are probably going to be doing it differently than you are, you need to be efficient because most likely these guys are not gonna be using Reclaim and they're going to be coming at it from the lens of they're going to be trying to do it fast with hot water only. So what they're going to try to do is hose the place down with wands and big surface cleaners and throwing a ton of water at it. And you, if you've ever done roofs or garages or you've had a commercial pressure washing business, you love eight gallons per minute, 12 gallons per minute, 3000 PSI, 4000 PSI. You're throwing a ton of energy out there. I mean, you're just like moving rocks and sand you're able to work really fast your machine's got a lot of power but when you start picking up water now you got to worry about how much water am i picking up turns out the best combination of power and efficiency for water efficiency fuel efficiency labor efficiency is two four gallon per minute surface cleaners at about 3000 PSI, maybe a little bit less. You can even back off your own loader valves a little bit and run them at a little less PSI because it tends to make the fittings last a little longer and it doesn't run your bearings on your surface cleaners too hard. And I'll show you what I mean by those later. Like I said, there's a ton of shit to go over, but I've found that instead, you got two different ways. You can go high pressure, high flow and use a ton of water, or you can try to go and be more water and time efficient and use more people. And so, yeah, I like, I love working with high flow and high pressure in non-reclaim situations, that's awesome. And even some reclaim situations, like if I'm gonna use the vacuum truck and I know I can just put a 3,000 gallons of water down in six hours and just hose a parking lot down, that's really great too. But for the most part, when you're in garages and you're trying to be economical and cost efficient for the customer so you actually get the job, you wind up having to, uh, find ways to go through less water usage. So if you have an eight gallon per minute skid, you can, with the right kind of a loader valve, run two guns at the same time or two surface cleaners and you can get more work done faster 
you can get more area clean for the same amount of water usage. So if I'm, if I'm running an eight gallon per minute surface cleaner and I'm just working by myself, it's almost better to have two guys with their own four gallon per minute surface cleaner working a little bit slower, but covering twice the area. So it's just more efficient. And it, with one of these systems here, let me uh, stop this and restart. One of these cleaning systems here, this say hot water truck and a vacuum trailer or a hot water truck and a vacuum trailer can do comfortably 30 to 40,000 square feet of surface cleaning a day. So 100,000 square foot garage, running two surface cleaners is about a day and a half, or sorry, two cleaning systems and four surface cleaners is about a day and a half. And uh, that's a pretty good amount of work to get done in a day. You think, well, you know, you should be able to work more and do bigger areas faster. But truth is when you're doing garages, a lot of the garages you're doing are like residential HOA garages for like condo buildings. And they can't, they basically can't keep up with you. They need to evacuate their garage while you're working and so a lot of times you'll only be able to do like a quarter or a third or a half of a structure in a day just because of the closure options are limited. They don't want to clear all the cars out in the city of Seattle because nobody will have anywhere to park. And they complain and get pissed. So uh, about 30,000 square feet a day is pretty good per system. So that's up to 60,000 square feet of day per day per system. And instead of those big Zamboni floor machines, the, the way we do it with these things is just way more thorough. They turn out way better. When you have a little uh, 16 inch floor tool that a guy's pushing around by hand just does a much better job than them driving those big Zamboni things. So they're basically only good for just smearing shit around in circles. They don't really actually clean the floors. So that's the way we have it. The way we okay, have it. now we're gonna be looking specifically at, we've had a good look at the hot water systems. Now we're gonna be having a look at the reclamation portion of this cleaning system. This is the vacuum that is put on the trailer. So. Like I said, when you're doing reclamation work, garages are going to be a big part of your work and they're a great source of income and they're fucking everywhere, so they're awesome. But garages have limitations. Ventilation, height clearance, weight of the entire system so it doesn't crash through the floors. That's why there's no floor on this trailer. It's this, this thing is all about weight. All the wood's been taken off. We're using the least amount of metal we can to make the system safe, but also strong enough to hold everything. But essentially what you have is you got another Honda 24 horse engine. If all your engines are the same, they're real easy to work on. It's real easy to keep parts on hand. So the Honda 24, basically the GX 670 or the 660 or the 690 is a really good engine to go with because they use a lot of the same parts. They can do, they have a lot of capabilities and Hondas are just awesome. They're totally awesome. They're way better than everything else. Fuck you, Vanguard, Kohler, all that shit. The Honda GX 670, is bulletproof. This engine right here is 15 years old. I've done the spark plugs, the fuel filter, and the air filter a couple of times each, and I do oil changes. That's all I've done, nothing else. They're awesome, nothing compares. Honda, I love you. You've been so good to me. I love my Honda engines, I've got seven of them. I love my Civic Type R because I do everything fast, including driving to my bids. I do everything stupid fast and stupid reliable. I gotta say, Hondas, I think I love nothing more than Honda on this planet. Honda, I love you. Yes, this hand, this hand loves you. This hand loves everything about you, Honda. Whoever you are, your racing heritage, you are the best company that has ever existed on this planet. I heard a rumor one time that they made all their guys that build the cars, they make them wear white lab coats. And if a guy gets a little bit of a grease stain, on his shirt, the guys on the production line know that something has gone wrong somewhere in the process. They got this whole samurai thing going on. I love that. I love Japanese culture. I love Japanese cars. And I love Japanese engines because they keep me in business. They keep us healthy. They keep us strong. They are excellent. There's nothing, nothing like them. The newer engines, the newer GXs, that's, an, that's a newer 630 right there. Not as good as the last generation, I must say. They're a little more complicated, a little more electronics. They're a little more, what do you call it? They're a little more finicky, finicky. They're not as, they're not as simple as the older ones. But you can't get the older ones anymore, you know, unless you can find one on Craigslist or something like that. Swoop it up. But these are still awesome. They're just not as good as those. But these, 
are miles better than the competition, in my humble opinion. Anyways, I just went off on a rant there about Honda. You obviously, oh, we have a wheel chalk here that's not where it's supposed to be, even though this is pretty flat. Let me put that down. Okay, the vacuum system. This essentially isn't much different than a carpet cleaning machine in its basic nuts and bolts. You have a 24 horse Honda engine pushing about a five inch NAI positive displacement roots blower. That's all this is. It's an engine and a blower. This is just like the kind of blowers they stick on cars with superchargers. It's basically a supercharger. It's just not designed for automotive applications. It's the same kind of blower. Actually, it's not the same. It's almost the same kind of blower that you would find in a carpet machine. Um, the carpet machines actually have two drive shafts, I don't know, because they push other things, water pumps and things like that. But basically this is a Tut Hill 4005, meaning 4005, 21L2, <coughs> uh, five inch roots blower. And uh, basically what this is, it is two, it's a big metal case that's sort of oval shaped. And there are two big chunks of metal in this thing that spin around in a circle. They sort of spin into each other. They're shaped like a figure eight. So the lobe of one eight, right? They're, and they're set 90 degrees apart. So you have one figure eight thing like this, and then you have another figure eight thing coming in at exactly a 90 degree angle. And as one spins, the other is spinning too. So the lobe of one figure eight goes into the middle of the other one, and they do this around and around and around in a circle. And in that process of those two figure eight lump shapes of metal spinning around, they create vacuum pressure. The vacuum pressure is created on this end and then positive air pressure is created on that end. So air comes into the top and shoots out the back. It comes in and gets compressed and is shoved out through the exhaust hose. And it's just a, a circular process going around and around and around over and over again, powered by that engine. And I have one of these blowers is starting to kind of rust out and seize up. So we're gonna be doing another video where we take one of these blowers apart and we sandblast it, clean it all up, put new bearings, new seals, put it back together, put it back in service. That's a whole process. We can do it in about a day, but this is one of the things, if you get into this kind of work, you're gonna to have to learn how to do if you don't wanna be throwing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars away at new parts and maintenance. You can just spend a hundred bucks and rebuild the thing and take a few hours of your time and save yourself $1,700 of something that's gonna to happen to you about every two or three years, depending on how you take care of these things. And uh, when you're running multiple blowers, you wind up doing a rebuild about every six months on one of your systems. So you have essentially an, an engine, just a small engine with a little electric start powering this blower, which sucks air through this hose here, which is coming from a screen filter. So before the air, is sucked out of the vacuum tank, creating pressure in the vacuum tank. It goes through here, this pipe, and then goes into this thing. And there's essentially a big air filter in here. That's kind of like a, a shop vac, wet, dry type air filter, like a basically a metal mesh, which just screens out rocks and sand and cigarette butts and bottle caps and anything that manages to not stay down in the tank, gets up into the intake, is caught by this little, uh, excuse me, that's burp, this little air filter here. And then, uh, so essentially what's happening is this blower is taking air out of this tank, which is a sealed component. It's a sealed system. It's like a vacuum truck. When you suck all the air out of this thing, air is going to want to go into it. So you hook up your vacuum hoses to your little fittings here, and then water and air and sand and all the garbage gets sucked in here. It all falls to the bottom. Meanwhile, the vacuum is sucking the air out of the top of the tank. So all the water and the sand and the mud and the rocks and the bleh, all the schmutz is sitting on the bottom of the tank and the blower is just skimming air off the top, creating a constant situation where the atmosphere is trying everything it can do to get into this tank through any way it can, namely your vacuum hoses. So these vacuum hoses come off of this reel, get hooked up to these fittings on either side of the tank. And then from there, there's one on each side. So there can be a guy working on this side and a guy working on this side and that vacuum hose is hooked up to a vacuum surface cleaner that he pushes around the ground like a lawnmower. And then the pressure hose comes off of the pressure washing system 
and also mates up to the vacuum surface cleaner. So you have this system where the truck is towing the trailer, you have a vacuum hose coming off the trailer and you have a pressure hose coming out of the truck. Those two things meet up to a vacuum surface cleaner. And this is gonna be a topic for another video, but I'll just show you one real quick. Now, you're not always using a vacuum surface cleaner. Sometimes you just have a wand hooked up and you have a vacuum hose going to a puddle in the ground. But when you use the vacuum surface cleaners, one of those things look like this thing right there. That is a standard right there. That's a normal whisper wash surface cleaner deck. It's been taken apart because it needs to be repaired. But this is basically a normal pressure washing surface cleaner that is modified to act like a vacuum also. So you've all had a surface cleaner, I'm assuming, or pushed a surface cleaner around on a driveway or a Safeway sidewalk or something like that. This is just like one of those, but it's also a vacuum that sucks the water up. So instead of surface cleaning and having water run out everywhere and then having to rinse it with a wand later, you just run this thing over and it sprays down and sucks up and then you're done. There's nothing else to do. So now it's not actually that simple, but it's almost that simple. Uh, in practice, there's another one back there. In practice, that is the idea. So my shop is an absolute mess. These are the salt spreaders. We'll get to that in a minute, but uh, we're getting ready to move. All these buildings are being knocked down. And not only that, we're running out of space anyways, because we're just growing. So the landlord sold the buildings. We have two months, we have to be into a new space. We have a new big space lined up, but it's way expensive. It's gonna be a big growth curve for us. That's why this place is such a mess and why I'm not doing the small component stuff today. We're just gonna look at the big stuff. But just so you know, this is what a vacuum surface cleaner is, what it looks like. We'll explain, we'll do a whole video on vacuum surface cleaning later. But, on to the big stuff. So we've looked at the hot water systems. We've looked at the vacuum systems in some, a little bit of detail. We'll go into more detail later, but this is essentially what you got. You got a Honda 24 hours engine pushing a pressure pump in the back of the truck or whatever. And then you have a Honda 24 horse engine pushing a five inch root blower. That comprises a cleaning system. Now, when you're cleaning parking garages, if you're doing say a 50,000 square foot parking garage, you're gonna wind up picking up about 5,000 gallons of water. Now you've noticed that trailer cannot possibly hold 5,000 gallons of water. In fact, it can only hold about 500 because it needs to be able to go into a parking garage. So how do you bring a giant vacuum truck into a parking garage? You don't. You bring a small vacuum truck into a parking garage and then you support it with a big vacuum truck that doesn't have to go in the parking garage. This is uh, it's a 2007 Freightliner M2, a uh, single axle, it probably was a box truck before National Truck Center got a hold of it and converted it into a vacuum truck. I bought this truck in 2016 for $59,000, I think it was. But actually after tax and license and interest on the loan and then having it shipped out here, it wound up being about 74,000 out the door. It's a lot of money, but that's what you gotta do. But good news. This baby's almost paid off. We got one or two more payments and that thing's done. I can't believe it. When I bought that thing, it was like the biggest purchase ever. I couldn't believe the bank actually gave me a loan to buy it. But yeah, the, the vacuum truck supports the small trailers on the job sites. And uh, you know, when those things fill up, the vacuum truck will roll up, empty them out, and they can basically keep working so that thing doesn't have to stop and go make a wastewater offload run at the decamp facility and shut, shut a job site down for five or six hours while it's gone, getting rid of some wastewater. So, yeah. Anyways, now, like I said, in the wintertime, you got to find something to do. So we plow snow. These are the Meyer eight-foot lot pros. We've got three of them. We put one on each of the white service body trucks and then... We got this other support truck here, Dodge Ram 2500 Cummins, that has a plow too. So we run these things hard in the wintertime. And uh, it used to be, you know, it used to be in the wintertime, it was like, you know, feast or famine. We'd do really good from like April till June. Then it would be like a dead spot for like maybe July and August. There's, you know, the, all the spring rush and stuff. And then the summers are actually not busy in pressure washing. All that stuff usually gets jammed out in the springtime or the earlier part of summer. And then there's kind of a dead spot for a couple months where you're just not as busy. And then things get really busy in the fall because what happens in pro commercial property maintenance is there's all these organizations that are trying to plan their monthly budgetary stuff and they want to cram all this work out as soon as they can. 
And, but what happens is, is sometimes they find that they have extra money in their budget for the year. And so there always seems to be like this big pop in the schedule around September, October, because everybody's finding out that they got an extra 2000 bucks in their maintenance budget and their building looks like shit and they want to have a soft wash. So we always get really busy around for pressure washing stuff. We always get really busy around like kind of late August, September, October, all the way into November is like rock and roll. We're like busy doing trash shoots, cleaning parking garages, uh, washing down buildings. It just it was like this weird pop at the end of the season. You wouldn't, it's not intuitive to think that you would get busy in the fall, but that's with, traditionally, that's a really good time for us. But come November, all the way through like March, it's like slim pickings, man, because we're in Seattle and it's rainy and people think you can't pressure wash in the rain, but you can, it's actually better to pressure wash in the rain because it makes it easier and it makes it go faster. You end up picking a lot more water and potentially picking up a lot of water but generally speaking, pressure washing in wet weather makes it easier because you have to put less water down and you have to do less work because you have the atmosphere helping you out. But in the wintertime, you gotta find something to do. Snow plowing and de-icing, that means using spreaders to throw rock salt down in parking lots is a really good way to, uh, to make money in the wintertime as a seasonal business. So you gotta be able to switch gears. You gotta be innovative. You gotta be, you gotta be willing to do new things and uh, get out of your comfort zone. So what we did, we start plowing snow and de-icing. Now let's go look at the plows here real quick. The plows are these eight foot Meyer lot pros. That's the ones we like to use. Now snow plowing is like this whole separate industry which we've only been doing it for a couple of years now, but it's awesome. It's been really awesome. I gotta say, already having a big commercial client base, all I had to do was send an email out and bam, we had like, we filled up the plowing schedule. We started the first year with one plow and one salt spreader. And that was those things inside the shop. I'll go show you those things that are back in the shop. We'll go look at those closely, but we started with one plow and I was like, well, let's just give this plowing thing a try. Let's see what happens. And uh, you know, it'll be like a test. Maybe it'll be like a $20,000 hole because by the time you buy a plow, a good one, you need a good one and you buy a salt spreader and then you buy a bunch of rock salt under those tarps there, you're, you're into a $20,000 investment. So you think how much money can I make plowing snow in Seattle? Almost none plowing snow because it doesn't really snow that much in Seattle, but there's a trick. There's an answer. De-icing just the de-icing portion of your service will be enough to pay for your plow. If it does snow, it's like a financial windfall. It's awesome. That's what we did. We set it up so that the de-icing portion of the service, it's two parts. You have plowing and you have de-icing. So if it's 30, 30 degrees out or 32 degrees out, but there's no snow on the ground, you can still go out and do some cold weather stuff by spreading rock salt. And then if it does snow, then your plow goes to work and you make even more money. But as it turns out, the amount of money you can make on spreading rock salt is enough to pay for the plowing portion of it, which is more expensive than the plows like $8,000. And you're going to spend a couple thousand having it professionally installed unless you want to do it yourself. And then the spreader is a couple thousand bucks and get a good commercial spreader. And then rock salt is anywhere from seven to 12 bucks a bag. So, you know, if you buy six pallets of rock salt, you you're into it. Um, about 3,000 bucks. So you got quite a bit of monetary investment there. We bought 18 pallets this year and we have six left over. It's nice to have some rock salt left over from the season because the rock salt starts coming in late and everybody wants it. So if you already got some on hand from last season, it makes the transition into the, the next season a lot more easier. But yeah, plowing's awesome. You know, whether you go with the V plow or straight plow and you have wing kits or no wing kits, for the kind of plowing we do, straight plows with wing kits, adjustable wing kits, are worked out really great. Cost efficient, there's less shit to break on them. They're awesome. We had a really good time. I think we, we spent, uh, this year we upgraded two more plows. I'm like, well, we'll just put a plow in all the trucks, give everybody a plow truck and everybody a salt spreader. And this year was awesome. We did, well, I probably shouldn't talk about money yet. I should think about whether or not we should talk about that. But we basically, basically we did over our initial equipment investment for the year. We, we spent 20,000 the first year on one plow and one spreader and a bunch of rock salt. 
maybe not, it was like 18,000, wasn't quite 20,000, but we spent about 18,000. I think we did, we had one snowstorm that first year, and I think we did, I think we did like 25,000 in sales, plowing a bunch of properties. So, and of course a lot of that went to labor and fuel, so we didn't like pay everything back, but we almost paid for the shit in one season. So, really good. So we decided to bump up two more plows this year, and these are the salt spreaders. These are tailgate salt spreaders. These things mount into the trailer hitch on your truck. And I'm sorry guys, this is a huge mess. We can't really uh, show you this stuff, but this is just a general look at the equipment. But basically what happens is these things plug into the trailer hitch on your truck and it's what's called a tailgate spreader. And then you just put a pallet of salt in the back of the truck. And then a guy jumps in the back of the truck and throws the bags into the spreader and you drive around the parking lot and you put the stuff down and you're there like 20 minutes and then you're out and you make a pretty good little invoice on it. So. Plowing and spreading. That's what you gotta do in the winter time. It's a pressure washer to stay in business. Okay. Okay guys, I know this has not been the best video because I'm, I'm not a YouTube influencer. I really have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. I'm just trying to uh, give you guys a window into what we're doing. So these videos are probably gonna get better. I don't know, maybe we'll have some fancy editing and stuff like that, but for now, I think we got the, uh, the basic equipment tour out of the way. But to summarize, we're running a couple of surface body trucks, a vacuum truck, a couple of trailers, a couple of vacuum trailers, and then we have another hot water system on a trailer. This allows us to run two, possibly three crews a day. And uh, <clears throat> maybe if we're, if we're rocking those three crews, we wind up doing somewhere between like 60 and 100,000 a month in sales. And that's not a lot of money, and, but it's enough when you have three or four employees, it's enough to get by. You have a lot of overhead, a lot of money goes into insurance. We'll get into the financials in another video and show you how this works. Break down how to charge, what to charge for, where your biggest expenses are. Basically all the money coming in, all the money going out so that you can make this a long-term sustainable business venture and be set apart as someone who's focused on stormwater friendly work and helping to do your small part to help clean up what's called the waters of the state or local natural waterways by doing environmentally friendly pressure washing. Guys, I, I don't know what's gonna happen with these videos, but I'm hoping that it's a weird little thing. Pressure washing is not gonna be some huge thing on YouTube, but it would be fun if there's a small community of guys that want to know about this stuff. So if you want me to keep doing these videos, um, I don't really care about monetizing the channel because I really don't like Google. I used Google. I have their email, Gmail, whatever service, but I got to say, I'm not stoked on, I'm not stoked on Google right now and I'm not stoked on YouTube. So I don't really care about making money off the channel, but I'll put these videos up to, uh, help us all out and talk and maybe we can all help each other grow and become better at what we do. Make some badass, hardcore American businesses to help, help this, help people have jobs, help, help work get done in the right way and make a little money and take care of our families, provide our kids and our grandkids some kind of a future. I think that's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to give people, give people work for good pay. That's a whole nother topic I want to get into is paying people well. Um, you know, as a single owner operator, when you start out with a pressure washer and then you find yourself 10 or 15 years later with like employees, you look back and you know what it's like being in the truck at three o'clock in the morning or bouncing your head off the steering wheel at 9 a.m. coming home after being out all night and you're just fucking tired. You know what it's like. You know what these guys go through. So it's important you pay them well. Pay them well. Pay your people. Because you're only, as a company, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And you're gonna have to let a lot of guys go because a lot of guys are not cut out for this kind of work, but we'll do another video on that. <clears throat> I got a little bit of getting over a small case of strep throat that I got after doing some uh, cryotherapy with my personal trainer. Um, I've been, uh, well, I'm a, not only you guys know I like to climb rocks, but I also, I like to do uh, train for sprinting. I like to sprint. I'm a, I'm a runner, long distance endurance runner, and I also enjoy sprinting. But um, my trainer's been having me do this cryotherapy where you go jump in this freezer that's like, it's like the size of a refrigerator and you get inside this thing and it's like 220 degrees below. I uh, got in this thing, it was like my second cryotherapy session and I went up having 
some kind of unexpressed, my body was kind of like in some sort of like stasis with like some cough or something like that. It was not, I got, it's not coronavirus, but uh, it was like a, a case of strep throat. Anyways, when I went into the cryo freezer, it caused my body to have like an immune response to this thing that was probably just kind of in kind of a stasis and it sort of came out as a cough and I'm almost over it. So anyways, that's why my voice is a little hoarse. Um, it's from my uh, physical training and cryotherapy that I did with my, uh, my personal trainer. This is this crazy Russian guy who was in the army at the same time I was, he came out and is in the same area. And I met him at Gold's gym like, uh, like 10 or 15 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. And I worked with him for about two years and then we kind of went our separate ways. And then during the pandemic, during the lockdowns, we couldn't really climb as much because the gyms were shut down in the evenings. You couldn't go in there and like train in the evening. So I was like, I started geeking out and sprinting. And so I hired my old trainer and that's kind of why I'm hanging out with Ed again. But anyways, maybe we'll do a video with Ed some other time. Yeah, let's see. I've been ranting about a bunch of unimportant nonsense. So let's call it for now. This will be the conclusion of the main equipment tour for all the major components we'll get into the sub components later which is like the surface cleaners the leaf blowers the small engine stuff the uh what kind of wands to use what kind of surface cleaners what kind of water tanks what kind of uh there's so many different kinds of things you know i i, could, I want to do a tour of that stuff now but honestly the shop is just a mess so we'll do that later i'm gonna have to chop about I think about 20 minutes of this footage out because it's just me blabbing about stuff. But, um, you know, real quick, let me just give you a quick eyeball. So, here. you know, you just got like tons of hose reels. This is another skid under construction. That's gonna be a cold water only skid, but there's a TIG welder, a plasma cutter, a bandsaw, another Lincoln 210 power MIG wire feed welder that can do TIG and stick also. That's a trash chute hoist. I mean, just all kinds of shit that you need I mean, this is a, this is, all this stuff is necessary. This is all stuff that we use because the idea is that you want to go and you want to be a pressure washer who can go anywhere and do anything. So, I mean, you're just like, this is all PPE, like Tyvek suits for doing disinfecting work. I mean, there's just so many things. When the phone starts ringing, when you put a website up that says I can reclaim power wash, you're going to wind up fucking having all this kind of shit. This is what it's just, this is what it turned into, you know? I mean, a whole thing full of hoses. That's all water hose down there. You know, that, that, that's for two trucks. I mean, I mean, this is all just extra wands, gas tanks, recrete for putting oil on parking stalls, different kinds of soaps and detergents. There's just so much stuff. These are filters for the water polishing systems. Those are uh, those little uh, oil pads for spills. I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. There's a vacuum boom up there. We gotta get into all this stuff. There's a lot of stuff to go over. Uh, we'll get into all of it, but let's call it now for the uh, the major components. If you guys have any questions on some of these uh, uh, these bigger machines, like the trucks and the trailers, um, we'll get into, we'll do videos in detail about those specific items. But uh, yeah, this will be fun. Thanks guys. I'm Ben with Mechanized Cleaning Solutions. Uh, we'll try to do another video in about a week. And I think we're gonna be getting into the next video. I think we'll get into, uh, we got a couple of options. I got a lot of options. I was thinking about <clears throat> one of the things I got to do is repair a roots blower. I got to re tear apart, sandblast, rebuild a roots blower. That'll be a good one. It's kind of like, what does it really need to be the third video? But you know, you can always go back and watch that one when it becomes more relevant for you. But that's something that's coming up that I need to do. There's also one where we got to do a, a charge coil repair on one of these small engine these Honda small engines, that's really important. Those are, you need, you know, you guys all know what I'm talking about. Like when you go to start your pressure washer up with the key start, it won't start because the battery's dead. You're like, why did the battery die? It's the engine's not charging it. These systems are really easy to repair and we'll show you how to do that. Yeah. Okay. Signing off. Thanks guys. Go get them.